technology. Um, my name, well, not all of technology. There's plenty left to be sorted, but we got our little corner of it sorted for the night. My name is Ware Harmon. I'm the executive director of Town Hall Seattle. And on behalf of our staff and our friends at the University Bookstore, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation of Dr. Charlotte Cote and Dana Arviso. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We are very glad you're here with us tonight, whether it's live in the room or at home, online, the web, wherever. Uh, to submit your question, I should say the presentation will run around 60 minutes, including a Q&A. To submit your questions and merge the questions from home and, and in the room, we ask you to use um, meet.ps forward slash Cote, can you bring, there we go, um, that slide up, or you can scan the QR code that's in front of you right now or in front of you on the screen at home uh, with your smartphone. We'll also drop the link in the chat so you can submit your question at any time tonight. We'll try to get to as many as possible, uh, and as a small reminder, if you want to watch the, the talk with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of, video play, of the video player. That's if you're at home, of course. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts all the time. Upcoming events include David Haskell with Leanda Lynn Haupt discussing the evolution over time of the ways that we experience sound, and the UW Grad, off, Grad School Office of Public Lectures presenting a talk by Kyle White called Braiding Kinship and Time, Indigenous Approaches to Environmental Justice. Visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as more programs are added, as I say, throughout the year. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors, lots of them. Part of both our Town Green Environmental Series and our Arno G. Matulski Science Lecture Series, this event is also supported by Microsoft and the Hugh and Jane Ferguson Foundation. But beyond all that, many of you likely know that Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members joining us in the room or from home. If you share their goal, Town Hall's goal of a community energized and empowered through questions of politics, science, and culture, please consider supporting us by becoming a member as well. One last thing. You'll certainly want to explore further after tonight's event, and the best way to do that is to purchase your own copy of Dr. Cote's book. So please visit the table over there in the auto, uh, and the friendly folks at the University Bookstore will be able to hook you up, or if you're at home, there's a link in the chat uh, and you can just use that, and also make a local independent bookstore purchase through the University Bookstore. Um, we appreciate it. And with all of that, Dr. Charlotte Cote um, Shishat Nucha Nult is Associate Professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington. She's been teaching in the program since 2001. Uh, a doctor in comparative ethnic studies from the University of California at Berkeley. She's affiliated faculty in the UW's Jackson School Canadian Studies Center. Dr. Cote also serves as co-editor for the UW Press's Indigenous Confluences series and is also the author of Spirits of Our Wailing Ancestors, Revitalizing Maka and Nucha Nuth Traditions, published in 2010. Dr. Cote is chair of the University of Washington's Intellectual House Advisory Committee. She's also the co-founder and chair of the UW's annual Living Breath of Washub Alt uh, Indigenous Foods Symposium held in May. Dr. Cote serves on the board of directors for the UW Center for American Indian Indigenous Studies, the Burke Museum's Native American Advisory Board, the Nala Ilihi uh, Fund Board, and the Northwest Coast Representative for NDN Collective. She also served on the Potlatch Fund Board of Directors for seven years as its president. Dana Arviso is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation and grew up on the Bishop Paiute Shoshone Indian Reservation in California. Dana proudly commits herself to improving the lives of youth, families, and communities through education and working for social improvements um, within the fields of education and philanthropy. She previously served as the executive director of Potlatch Fund, a Native American-led foundation, and has served on the boards of Social Justice Fund Northwest, Native Americans in Philanthropy, American Indian Graduate Center, and 501 Commons. And she also serves on the planning committee for the Indigenous Food Symposium alongside Dr. Cote. Dr. Cote's new book, A Drum in One Hand, A Sockeye in the Other, Stories of Indigenous Food Sovereignty from the Northwest Coast is the subject of their discussion tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dana Arviso and Dr. Charlotte Cote. Yeah, 
It feels so strange to be dressed up. <laughs> I don't know the last we time I wore... We almost wore our sweats. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the last time I wore heels. It feels a little odd. Um, wow, these lights are very bright, but it's good to see all of you here in person, and I know we have a lot of people that are online as well. Um, and I'm so happy to be here in conversation with Dr. Cote. Um, I just want to take a moment to share a little bit about um, how I know her. Uh, she's been a friend, a colleague, a boss. <laughs> Uh, I was a student in one of her classes, and she serves on my um, doctoral committee where, at UW, where I'm getting my, my PhD. Um, but I know she would like to introduce herself, and we can talk a little bit more about how we know each other as we go. Yes. Well, Tlaia um, uh, greetings, everyone. Welcome. Uklama Lutis Mayult, Tsisha Aksuma. So in my language, I'm sharing with you that my koas, or my indigenous name, is Lotis Mayot. It um, literally translates to carrying thunder, and it's connected to my whaling heritage. My people are the Tsishat. We are an indigenous nation on the northwest coast of Vancouver Island, um, or in the west coast of Vancouver Island, and we're one of the central groups that make up the larger New Chanoth Nation on Vancouver Island. And so, yeah, Dana and I have, I think, 17 years we've known each other. I first met Dana when she was a student in my um, one of my classes at uh, when she was a graduate student many years ago, and then she left academe to pursue working in the, uh, the nonprofit world in philanthropy and uh, working with communities and building and strengthening um, healthy indigenous nations. And she moved over into the executive director position at the Potlatch Fund. And a few years later, I, um, I was on the board at that time, and a few years later, I uh, became the president of the organization. So we've been kind of following each other around for quite a, quite a few years. And uh, then Dana left the nonprofit world and came back to UW and works there in the position of director in Unite Ed, the College of Education. And as she mentioned, uh, I serve on her dissertation committee, her PhD committee. So a little bit about us. We were talking in the green room about how, um, how it feels to be in conversation. And I was sharing that it reminds me of when I was growing up. And I would get in the car with my grandma, and we would just go around visiting relatives. Um, and you would just sit and talk for hours and you know catch up about family history. But it's also a place where I heard so many stories about my grandma's youth and her experiences um, going to boarding school. and so. I don't know that we'll be getting, we'll, we'll be here for hours, <laughs> but I definitely think that, that we bring kind of this relationality and this, um, this long conversation that we've been having across years. Uh, we're just structuring a little bit more for you tonight. Yeah. Um, so okay. I'm actually going to um, start with asking Charlotte a couple questions about the book itself. Um, so in the introduction, Charlotte, you talk about sharing story as methodology. Can you say more about that and share a story with us from your book? Thank you, and I am. I'm going to start. I started my book with a story, with this story, and I want to share it with you, and then I'm going to explain why I use this story to start this, this book, this book about indigenous food traditions. And so this story comes from one of my favorite pastimes and my um, link to who I am as a Northwest Coast indigenous person. Berry picking is big for all of us. If any of you have come from the Northwest Coast, here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, many people pick the mountain huckleberry. Well, in my community, we pick kalkawi. Kalkawi is a wild trailing blackberry. And so this story comes from one of those adventures about 10 years ago 
um, and it was a berry picking adventure with, with uh, my auntie, Miss Bun. So I'm going to share that with you. Oops, I just lost the page. These chairs are really comfortable. I might end up snoozing halfway through here. <laughs> okay. The story is called Shut Up, We're Bonding. <laughs> On a hot summer day, my Auntie Mispin and I were doing what we had always done since I was a young girl. We were driving on winding, dusty gravel roads up steep mountains in the Hahotli, our ancestral homelands, of my people, the Tsishot on the west coast of Vancouver Island. We are on our quest for the sweet and delectable Kalkawi, the wild trailing blackberry. These Kalkawi are quite different than the Tupkapea, that is the Himalayan back blackberry that you see growing around the urban centers. Uh, the Kalkawi is much smaller, hardier, and considerably richer in antioxidants than its tame cousin and is high in vitamin C, potassium, magnesium, and other flavonoid phytochemicals. It grows high in the mountains in flat areas within the dense coastal rainforests that blanket the northwest coast. It almost seems like a misnomer to call Kalkawi wild. The Nuchanalhlat, the Nuchanal people, like other indigenous peoples, cultivated lands in our Haholhli to encourage growth of certain food plants. And this was done through sophisticated, selective, and controlled burning, promoting the growth and production of berry vines. But through colonization and forced placement on reserves, we lost many of our traditional harvesting sites, which fell under the control of forestry companies. And as a result, we lost our ability to engineer the lands for production. However, this ancestral knowledge continued to be transferred through the generations. And my grandfather, Huey, Auntie Mispan's father, was raised with the understanding and ecological knowledge of land burning. Grandpa would drive through our forest area, our forest harvesting, excuse me, our former harvesting sites, and take note of where the forestry co companies were slash burning to remove the underbrush to make it easier to cut trees and remove the fallen logs. He knew that in a few years these would be ideal growing areas for the Kalkoe. Grandpa passed on his cultural knowledge to us, especially the knowledge of where to find the best nutchu or berry patch. But this afternoon was not the day for finding a good nut shoe, and there we were, hours later, still looking for one. The day shifted into the late afternoon, and I was getting tired of looking for Kalkoe, what seemed to be a hopeless situation. I was about ready to tell my auntie we should just give up and go home. And then my auntie steered around a slight bend in the gravel road, and there it was, a few yards ahead of us on the right side of the road, a nutshu. My aunt slammed on the vehicle brakes and hastily pulled over to the side of the narrow road. Since the sun was already going down on the side of the mountain, we needed to hurry. We grabbed our berry-picking pails out of the trunk of the car and ran to the small patch of ripe, deep purple kalkoe, just waiting to be plucked from their hardy vines. I found a comfortable spot close to the road, and Auntie Mispan made her way through the vines to start picking from the other side of the patch, about 20, about 20 feet away. And then we began plucking berries to our heart's content. My head was down, my fingers were going a mile a minute, and my thoughts were lost in berry-picking heaven. We had been picking for about 15 minutes when I suddenly felt my aunt rush past me. I pulled my head up from the vines to ask what the heck was going on. What's the matter, I queried. Sometimes when we were picking berries, we'd run into bears that were also enjoying a berry feast. And while they usually didn't bother us, we had to be cautious if we encountered a mother with her cubs, as she, was, as she, likely, didn't, as she likely did not want us to come close to them. But I looked around and did not see any. Bees, bees, Auntie Mispin yelled, madly swat swatting at the air around her head as she ran toward our vehicle. My aunt had stepped right in the middle of a nest. What the hell, I gasped. I grabbed my pail and stumbled to my feet, spilling all the juicy berries I was dreaming about eating when I got home. I sprinted behind my aunt while swatting at the bees that were now after me. We got into the vehicle and jumped inside. 
Auntie Mispin started the car and we drove off, leaving behind the bees and leaving behind most of our kalkawi. By this time, I had, I had enough and I was ready to call it a day. I was tired, I was hungry, I was aching from the couple of bee stings I received, but not my Auntie Mispun. She wanted her kultkawi and the boiling sun, dust, dirt, hunger, and a few bee stings were not going to keep her from getting them. I looked at my aunt and said, it's hopeless, why don't we just go home? This is crazy, we're never going to find any berries. My aunt responded, shut up, we're bonding. And with a trickle of sweat running down her cheek, a slight smile on her lips, and a persistent look in her eyes, she continued driving up the mountain. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Um, it reminds me of growing up. Um, I grew up in the Owens Valley, or as we call it, Paihanadu. And my dad would often pile all of us kids into the car and we would go driving around on dirt roads up near the mountains. And I think when we were kids, we didn't really understand what we were doing. We just got in the car and went and it was an adventure of the day and he'd pack sandwiches and food for us. But he was always very intentional. He knew what we were doing. He would stop along the road, we would check out the creeks and he was looking for wild watercress. Um, and then other times in my childhood, we would um, make a very intentional trip to go harvest pine nuts, which grow really well in the Eastern Sierra. So I definitely have some experiences and really beautiful memories of bonding with my family amidst the pitch that comes off <laughs> of the pine nuts being stuck in your hair and on all over your fingers. Um, but I think that's, that's part of like what forms your core memories. I want to um, also make sure that we take some time to talk about some of the, the core ideas that are in your book. Um, so I'm going to start with asking you the question of what does food sovereignty mean and what does it mean to indigenize it? Okay. And I just wanted to also acknowledge that the slides that you see, these are some of the photos are the photos that I have in the book and I have quotes that we will be speaking to as well that you'll see as they come up. So what we're going through, what Dana and I are going through will be reflected up there as well. Food sovereignty, so it's a concept. It's, it came out of a food movement um, um, in the 1980s. We started seeing um, more people focusing on these shifts in the global food movement, moving from food insecurity or food security to a movement that really brought the discussion and conversation around foods back into the local um, communities. Um, and this really began in 1983 with um, the uh, organization called La Via Campesina. They're an organization of small and mid-scale farmers and peasants, um, indigenous people, women are part of this organization. Um, and they really come together in defense of small scale, uh, small scale and polyculture, polyculture agriculture as a way to promote social justice and dignity. Um, it's a movement that strongly opposes corporate driven agriculture and transnational uh, companies that are destroying people and nature. And the, the concept itself was developed over quite a few years until two seven, two, 2007 when the, the concept became what we see today as food sovereignty. And this is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. It puts the aspirations and needs of those who produce distribute and consume food at the heart of food systems and policies rather than the demands of markets and corporations. So we started seeing this movement towards um, uh, this really a rights-based discourse that it was looking at more the political and economic side of these food movements that, that we were seeing or this food movement that we were seeing growing through the 1980s into present day. And so what I look at in my book is 
really looking at that concept and how can indigenous peoples, how can we in our communities um, take that concept and apply it to what we're doing in our communities. And so in some articles, past articles that I wrote, I look at the concept and I say, we need to move beyond a rights-based discourse and indigenize that concept. So indigenizing that concept moves it beyond a political and economic right that is a right that we would be given from a state or from a government and moves it back into our communities and it becoming a responsibility, a responsibility for us to re-engage with our, with our uh, foods, with our traditions, revitalizing our food ways, but the responsibility on us to strengthen and reinforce those relationships that we have to everything that gives itself to us as food, and as a result, strengthening our relationships to our environment as well. That's what it means to indigenize food sovereignty. Great, well I think you covered one of my other questions, which was to tell us a little bit about the history of the food sovereignty movement. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to add to that? I don't think so. I okay. might come back to it, but okay. we, I know we have a few more questions, yeah. Great, um, so in your preface, you talk about the traditional foods that you were raised with and how fortunate you feel to have been raised in a health conscious household. You also make the argument that our taste buds and our diets have been colonized by food companies' calibrated bliss points of salt, sugar, and fat. Can you say more about how colonization has impacted the foods that we eat? Hmm, yeah. Well, I wanna come back, I'm gonna to come to that, but I'm gonna come back to the story because the story really leads into this. Um, the reason why I include so much of storytelling in this book, because it's really, in looking at colonization and the impact of colonization on indigenous peoples, a lot of that process of not just colonization, but the perpetuation of settler colonialism has a lot to do about, with what we call eraser. That is the eraser of our identities, the, the force, the colonial racer that removed us from our lands or tempted to force us away from our lands, our waterways, our foods, our traditions, our languages. Um, and a lot of it was just about silencing our voices. And so in many ways, it's not surprising that a book uh, that comes from an indigenous uh, methodology um, uh, that's centered in indigenous knowledge, that it would be told through a methodology of storytelling. We are an oral tradition, and even though they are stories that were told to me orally and I wrote them down, they're still a part of that. Um, stories remind us of who we are and where we belong, who we belong to, who are, who are our relatives, not just our human relatives, but our non-human kinfolk. Um, and so, they really, uh, stories remind us of those relationships that we have to our natural world, our supernatural world, and to everything around us. And so it really becomes part of the resistance that, that we're experiencing in our communities, the cultural revitalization we're experiencing in our communities, and it, a lot of it is pushing back against, that, uh, against colonialism. And a major part of that is pushing back at what had happened to us as a result of colonization and, what is and how that has impacted our diets. In looking at Native American health, the Indian Health Service here in the United States um, shows that heart disease and diabetes are the leading cause of death of Native Americans. And we see the same kind of statistics in Canada, in the country where I grew up. Prior to colonization, our communities were healthy. We had traditional hunting, fishing, harvesting um, activities that provided very nutrient-rich, nutrient-dense diets. Um, we were dependent on vegetable proteins, animal proteins, depending on your indigenous community. And there were many plants um, 
that were sources of, of nutrients as well, and we still see those in our communities today. But post-colonization, there has been a continual shift in our diets, very similar to what we're seeing in the rest of the world, this westernized diet. And as a result of that, it's impacted our health. But what we also see is how we indigenous peoples, like all other peoples, were really being pulled into these savvy marketing um, campaigns of multi-million dollar capitalist corporations uh, to get their, for, uh, to promote and to push these industrialized foods on us. Um, so, in the, the US, for example, food companies spent billions of dollars getting these foods, these manufactured and industrialized foods, to these bliss points. And it isn't a coincidence that you have foods that you'll say, you know, and I hear this, and I'll say this myself, you know, I really am dying for that food. I just need some fries today. You know, it, and it's not surprising that we're, we have those kinds of um, urges and in many ways addictions because the way that they created these bliss points is the way, is, is a way in, men, in many ways it's to get us addicted to those foods. And so we see that with, um, with the industrialized foods, the acceleration of this Western diet um, that was designed to give instant gratification with these processed foods. Processed foods are digested very, very quickly. So it, it's not surprising that you eat more of it because your body isn't being um, satisfied as quickly as if you have more nutrient-dense foods, especially foods here in the Northwest Coast are seafoods are, that are very, very high in omega-3 um, essential oils. Um, but the blood gets besieged with high levels of salt, sugar, and fat, causing the brain to react the same way it does to narcotics, following the same neurological circuitry to reach the brain's pleasure zones. And so you start feeling those same sensations that somebody who has addictions feel. And you can have those same sensations around food. And so it really made me think about that when I was, um, when I was writing this book because I was raised with, with most, most of my diet when I was young and, and to this very day because I followed a very healthy lifestyle is that I eat a lot of cultural foods. Our foods, which is in my language is ha'um or ha'um shtup for a variety of foods. And I make sure that my diet is centered in those foods because I know how they make me feel. And I know that those foods, because I've never lost that, I, my, my, my taste buds really haven't been colonized and many are, of our taste buds have. And it's really unlearning those behaviors so that we can re-indigenize our diets again, which is really what we need to do. And a lot of that is going back to those cultural foods or bringing more cultural and nutritious foods into our diet. Absolutely. I can relate because in this last phase of the pandemic, I've gone back to cheese. Mm. <laughs> and let me tell you, most Native Americans are lactose intolerant, myself included. Um, but cheese is amazing <laughs> and very addictive. <laughs> but for the most part, Charlotte, um, what you write about in your book really resonates for me. Um, my own father, um, ra who raised us in, in Paiute territory, raised us to be very conscious about what we eat and to stay away from those processed, artificial, and nutritionally empty foods. And those les lessons still resonate with me and help me to set healthy habits as an adult. It's something that I'm very conscious of um, as an auntie to my nephew when I'm packing us a lunch or making us a snack. I really want him to grow up um, understanding and what healthy foods are and being able to make those choices for himself. Mm. So my question is, how do you think we can inspire and support indigenous families to adopt these practices? Hmm. Well, if there wasn't a time when we should be having these conversations, I mean, 
with what has happened with us in the last two years with this global pandemic, we need to have more of these conversations about what it means to be healthy and how do we become healthy, the importance of that. And, you know, we saw a worldwide economic and um, social devastation that was brought on by COVID-19. All of us have been impacted by it. All of us, and many of us are still being impacted even though we're hopefully on the end where we can start getting back to some, some type of normalcy. Um, the virus impacted everyone. It wasn't discriminating. It impacted everyone, but it was ability, it was the ability of communities to respond that was unequal. And because of racial and economic in, in inequalities that we see embedded in the system here in the United States as well as in Canada, the effects were compounded for us as well as for people of color. And so when we were going through this, I was actually in the middle of writing this book, fi finalizing this book in um, 2020. And uh, I really thought about this, that, you know, there were indigenous communities, how, what was happening to us? And I don't know how many, and I, I think, I mean, I can't see anyone out there, but I'm sure some of you are from ind indigenous communities. Um, we were hit very, very hard. Many of our communities across the United States and Canada, including mine, the New Channel, which had been hit very hard by the coronavirus. And I don't know, Dane, if you want to mention the Navajo, which is a very, very large, um, uh, large tribe, were also hit very hard by the coronavirus. Um, we, media, the media, health officials, politicians, kept focusing on this vaccine, and rightfully so, I am not against it. Both of us have been vaccinated, we've been boosted. But why wasn't there also, as part of that narrative about, about the vaccines and about be, staying healthy and being safe, why wasn't part of that, that, that narrative about eating right and having access to healthy foods, especially the people who were more vulnerable to COVID? who were the ones who, because of their socioeconomic conditions, didn't have the money to, to be able to purchase foods to stay healthy. And so it really made me think as I was finishing, putting the final touch, touches on this, uh, on this um, book, um, you know, that we really needed to open up those conversations and start having cons concert conversations about what it means to be healthy. And so in, in going back to that question, Dana, I think a lot of it is sharing with others, um, sharing our story, uh, especially if we are people who are really health conscious, sharing that story with each other. Um, and I share a lot of stories, um, stories in this book as well. Getting involved in, in projects um, such as salmon restoration is very, very important. Um, creating community gardens. Many tribal communities now are engaging in these community garden projects as a way to be healthy. Even here in the Northwest Coast, when we work, we're marine-based cultures, yet we're seeing community gardens as a way to help as we're moving towards um, strengthening our health and wellness in our communities, that we're finding other ways outside of what, what would have been um, part of our traditional economies, even though we did harvest, we harvested berries, we harvest, harvest and still do harvest berries, plants, and medicines. Um, but we also um, are seeing these garden projects, bringing in nutritious foods as being important to that movement that we're seeing in that revitalization of health and wellness in our communities. And so I write in my book, one of my chapters focuses on my sister, my sister Gail. And the reason why I wrote this book, because Gail started a uh, community garden um, seven, let's see, eight, eight years ago now, or eight or nine years ago. And the first time she brought me through that garden, we were walking through the garden and I said to her, this is really 
I mean, it, it, it was, she was growing like Jurassic Park kale in this garden. I mean, it was amazing. And I can barely grow, you know, my kale turns out this big when I attempt to grow kale in my little, my little yard here in Seattle. Um, but I said, you know, what inspired you to do this? Because it wasn't just about growing the garden, cultivating a garden. It was where she decided to grow it. She grew her garden on what was a former boarding school site. And I don't know how many of you know about the tragic legacy history of boarding schools. Um, 19, uh, late 1800s in both the United States and Canada, this was a system of education enforced on our people. Um, it took our children away from our communities. Children as young as five, even as young as three, were taken and placed in these boarding schools um, to be inculcated with Western values, um, to be uh, separated from family, community, and also to be separated from our nutritious foods. Many of the children that went to this school where Gail cultivated this garden never went home. And a testament to that is these boarding, at these boarding schools today, um, those old former boarding school sites, they're now going into these communities and finding um, unmarked graves. It's even hard for me to talk about this, and I hope I'm not triggering anybody by sharing this story with you, sharing this history with you. It's a sad history, but it's our, our history and it needs to be told. And so when Gail told me she was going to build that garden there where there was so much pain and so much sorrow there, I said, why here? And she said, those children never made it home. They, they kept with them a lot of pain. There's also pain in this land. This land needs to heal too. That's what this garden's going to do. It's going to heal that land. And the plants that we plant here and the vegetables and the fruit we're going to grow is going to heal our people. How profound. And I told her after the second year when we walked through that garden, I said, I'm writing about you. And she laughed because my sister's not somebody who does things for any accolades. She does it because she's a warrior and that's her job. And so I think sharing those kind of stories is important. And I know, Dana, you have some ideas around this. You've worked most of your life in areas in the nonprofit world and the, world work, the work you're doing, especially the research you're doing with your dissertation um, around what it means to be healthy and to help and for us to, to work together in promoting healthy communities. So I think you had some ideas as well as you, that you wanted to share about that. Well, my first job out of college, actually, <laughs> I went back to Bishop and I worked in the Tribal Family Literacy Program, um, Tuna Wanobi. Uh, I worked with three and four-year-olds. Um, and it's, it's funny because some of them just started graduating from high school in the last couple of years. And I don't think that I've gotten any older, but somehow they did. <laughs> Um, but a couple of things come to mind. I mean, I, I think about this, too, in my role as an auntie, but I think, you know, some of the stories that we shared about growing up and having the opportunity to spend time with family and to um, learn how to harvest traditional foods, I mean, I think it's so important to create those really positive core memories and experiences for kids especially around helping them to understand where their food comes from. Um, you know, I, I, I think there was a point in time when um, my nephew thought, well, all berries come from the grocery store. And I was like, no, they don't. Your grandpa grows berries in his garden, and look, there's some grapes growing here in the yard. And I think, you know, just making sure that they really know those connections of where does our food come from? It doesn't just get delivered from trucks and we buy it at the store, and that's how we get raspberries. Um, and then I think, you know, the other thing is just, as you, as you said in your book, um, understanding that to be connected back to our foods is also about reclaiming our culture. It's, it's a way to overcome that 
um, colonial experience that we went through, that forced relocation, that growing up in boarding schools where our diets were radically changed by that. And a lot of the foods that we think of as being traditional, like fry bread, not traditional at all. Definitely a food of survival that kept people alive, but not something that was a part of our, our way of life before colonization. Mm -hmm. How are we doing on time, by the way? I'm not sure because we started a little bit late. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we in the clock? I don't know, I don't even see the clock. <laughs> well, Okay, perfect. For us to speak or with the Q&A as well? Yeah, with Q&A, but it doesn't, you know, we can go over it after. Oh, okay. Okay, I have one more question and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. Um, but it's a little disorienting with the lights and everything. I'm like, can we talk all night? Because I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> for my final question, I'd like to ask about the importance of salmon in Northwest tribal cultures. In past research that I've done with Native youth on protecting the environment, we spoke about how the potential loss of salmon in particular would devastate local tribes and their traditional cultures. Could you share your perspective on the importance of preserving salmon and salmon habitat for future generations? Yeah, it's interesting. I just, in my class today, and I, I know some of my students are streaming in, um, we, we looked, we were, um, I showed two videos, very important videos of two very important people. Uh, one is Dr. Kyle Paus white He is going to be speaking here on Monday. He's coming to the University of Washington campus and he'll, he's doing a town hall here. So I don't know if there's any information on him, but you can find it on the town hall website. He's a Potawatomi scholar and he does a lot of work around climate change. Um, mostly in um, the, the Menominee area and his people's area, but he does some work here as well and some research in the Northwest Coast. The other person whose video we watched today was Dr. Robin Kimmer. Dr. Robin Kimmer wrote a wonderful book called Braiding Sweetgrass, and if you haven't read it, you need to go out and get this book. One of the most amazing books that probably changed my life with respect to what she, the way that she approaches um, our connections to the environment, that we don't have authority over that those environments. We have a relationship with those environments and it's a relationship built on reciprocity. And we're really seeing a strain being put on that relationship here with coastal indigenous peoples today because of global climate change, because of the warming of our waters. I mean, this last summer, if you can all remember when we went through that heat dome, and I mean, I don't know if you have air conditioning. I mean, no one ever thought of having air conditioning in Seattle. I mean, all I could think of was, I need to go to a tribal casino. I know it's going to be cold there. <laughs> I know they have air conditioning. <laughs> but I mean, it, we really are seeing significant changes and those changes are impacting our foods, our ha'um, our traditional foods. And so um, I wanted to write about that and I do, I have one chapter that's on, um, on salmon on uh, especially mi'at, which is sakai salmon, the name for sakai salmon in our, in our language. And I talk about uh, this, especially the Northwest Coast and how the Northwest Coast provides an excep exceptionally rich and nurturing environment for salmon, um, as well as a, a sustainable balance between salmon and the human ecosystems, which has evolved over the years, over thousands of years into this very respectful and very reciprocal relationship. Um, they, salmon was our primary food source and as a result, um, we have, uh, it wasn't taken for granted. Today it still isn't taken for granted. We have this uh, spirit of the salmon has been celebrated through salmon ceremonies and we've seen the revitalization of that here in the Pacific Northwest. 
with in the summer, or as those salmon are running through our communities, moving through our communities. We're showing reverence to the spirit of the salmon that continually brings that salmon back to us as food. And you ask any person from the Northwest Coast about the foods they grew up with, and most often they'll say that they grew up with salmon and that they still rely on salmon. It plays a major role in our nutritional health, which is why we need to put so much effort into salmon restoration product, projects and also creating awareness about the importance of salmon. And I grew up around salmon, and I, I in the chapter that I share about salmon, I talk about salmon. When I was a kid, how there was so much salmon that when you're walking in the river that runs through our play, through our community, and the river of Tsuma'as, which means washing in our in our language, you could feel the salmon run going between your legs as you're wa walking through the river. That's how much salmon we had. And we grew up as fishers. We still fish. I, I talk about in my book, and I have some photos in the slide uh, show of our fish day, our communal fish day. We still come together in the summer months to have a to do communal fishing. But we also have um, individual fishing, where you can have your own individual net and go out fishing. And my sister Gail and I were one of the first fishers. And I talk about this in my book, all the fishing adventures that we had in the 1980s. And then when I moved away to go to school, I never really had the time to go out fishing with her. I'd go, I'd go home every year, except the last couple of years because of, because of the COVID restrictions at the border. Um, but every year I can salmon or jar salmon, and I talk about that in the book. I talk about smoking salmon with my Auntie Marilyn, and I have some photos of Marilyn and Auntie Marilyn and I smoking fish and preparing fish. Um, but the last couple of years before, uh, before COVID restricted me going home, my sister and I decided we were going to revive our fishing tradition. And so I want to end with this story. And it's um, the story out of my salmon chapter. And this um, story is called Salmon and a Few Bags of Cheesies. And uh, if you've never been to Canada, you don't know what cheesies are. And they're not Cheetos. I've had people say that they're Cheetos. They're not. <laughs> they're much better. But they are our junk food. So, Colonialism and capitalism have put a strain on our communal fish pot, but the fire under it has not burned out. Some of our cultural food traditions have changed, but as, but as, but as is demonstrated, I'm having a hard time seeing let me move here. But as is demonstrated by my interviews and interviews conducted by Janice Johnson, who is a community member who did her dissertation on salmon, uh, with community members who still process foods, many Tzishot members are actively engaging in strengthening and revitalizing our relationships to our foods. And it is their stories that keep alive our hopes and dreams of returning to traditional healthy lifestyles before the Mamathni, or the white settlers, came and disrupted our cultures and societies. Salmon will stay at the core of our cultural identity, providing us with dietary and spiritual nourishment fed to us by Tsuma'as, the river that feeds us cultural, spiritual, and dietary sustenance. In 2018, I was able to spend most of the summer back in my Tzishat community, and my sister and I decided to revive our gillnet fishing team. Gail has continued to gillnet fish throughout the years, and her fishing partner is her former husband, Reg, which her current husband, Richie, doesn't mind. She's maintained a friendship with Reg. I was excited to gillnet fish once again, and to my sister's surprise, I still had my old royal blue, f blue fishing attire from the 1980s. Gillnet fishing opens, on the, opens as the miat, or sakai salmon, make their way up the tsuma'as. And when the fish runs begin to enter our territory, the day and time are scheduled, usually a 12-hour opening beginning at 6 or 8 in the evening and closing at 5 or 6 in the morning. 
Most fishers, once they set their net, stay with the net all evening, checking it periodically to re remove any fish that have been caught. Gail and I got our fishing supplies ready. Lots of coffee for her and Reg, lots of water for me, salmon sandwiches, a few bags of cheesies, and a bag of raw almonds. As the fish opening neared, we packed our net and supplies in the boat, hooked up the boat to Gail, Gail's husband Richie's truck, and headed to the marina, marina to launch our boat. Then along with all the other fishers in the water, we started looking for a good place to set the net and camp for the evening. At first it was fun, like the old days, and Gail and I rehashed stories about our fishing adventures, laughing as we drank our coffee and water and ate some of our snacks. A few hours went by and we began our first check of the net. We put on our headlamps, which help you see, in the, see the net in the dark, bent over the edge of the boat and began pulling up the net to check if we had caught any fish. As we made our way along the net, we took off the fish and placed them in a container in the boat. We made our way to the end of the net and then sat down in, in the boat for a few hours before doing the same thing over again. We pulled out our smokes, a nasty fishing habit, grabbed some more coffee, and then checked Facebook to see how the other fishers were doing. I'd forgotten how extended and tedious gillnet fishing was, and our laughing began turning into complaints as my sister and I got wet, cold, and tired. Five hours into the 12-hour fishing opening, our conversations about the fun we had, we had fishing took a turn. I said to my sister, I'm hungry. Is this all we have for food? Maybe we should phone Richie to bring us some more fish sandwiches or hamburgers. My sister replied, well, quit eating all the food. I told, you it we had, I told you it had to last us all night. A few minutes later, I was at it again. Is this it for water? I thought we had brought another jug. My sister replied, no, we didn't. I can't believe you already drank all the water. Jesus. <laughs> A half an hour later, I said to my sister, sis, I need to pee. My sister replied, for Christ's sake, then stick your bum over the edge and pee. I looked at her and she looked at me and we burst out laughing. I took my pee and we snuggled back down into the front of the boat together and stared out into the calm darkness of the night as the soft waves rocked our boat back and forth. It would be a few more hours before we had to check our net again. At the back of the boat, Reg sat cigarette in hand, staring out at the water, listening to his crazy fishing partners. Two sisters, reinforcing their love for each other as they strengthen their cultural ties and bonds to Miat, to the Sakai salmon, and to Tsuma'as, the river that runs through us. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. I think we might have time for a couple of questions. Waiting for a connection. Oh, OK. We do have some questions. OK, I'm going to start with the first question. Um, what are some of the best ways for non-Indigenous people in the Pacific Northwest to support your work? Oh, that's wonderful. That's a great question. I talk about this in my class a lot, what it means to be an ally. Because a lot of what I write about, and I say in this book in the preface, it isn't a book for, it, it's a book for everyone. We're all, everyone needs to know about how to be healthy. And I think we can all work together in just creating these, creating spaces where we can come together and have conversations like this, where we can discuss and, 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 and cre create these spaces where we can discuss the importance of uh, what it means to be healthy, that we can really look at these, um, these larger global food systems together and understand the importance of all of us working at, um, 
uh, moving away from global and industrialized food and food production and the commodification of food, that is, that you're growing food for money and not growing food for, to, feed, um, the hung to feed hunger or to uh, eliminate hunger uh, globally. We produce more, we produce enough food to feed the global population twice over, yet over seven billion people in the world are, are facing food insecurity. So I think as um, communities, we can come together, we can become allies, we can create the awareness and spread the word. So if you hear about salmon restoration projects in tribal communities, um, ask how you can support and engage with them um, and really create spaces for dialogue because a lot of these issues that we face in our communities, we face in the larger societies. So it makes sense that we come together in allyship as a way to overcome some of these issues that we have, especially around industrialized foods. Um, maybe Dana, you wanted to share as well? Um, well, I want to... I, that, that was a question that was taken from online. Um, I want to see if we have questions from our in-person audience as well. I want to know how your grandpa grew up inculcating some spiritual side foods to the part he was teaching and gathering the food that he was teaching. Yeah. Oh, spirituality is so important in our food systems, especially, and as I mentioned, the first salmon ceremony, giving the, 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 looking at food as a sacred gift. And it's really hard to think about that when the only foods you get are wrapped in, in plastic and in styrofoam that you get in, in markets. It's very hard to understand the spiritual relationship you have to foods. My grandfather, I grew up next door to my grandparents, and uh, my grandfather instilled in, that, in, in all of us, in all his children and all his grandchildren, to have that understanding of gratitude that everything that gives its life, and it doesn't matter, you don't put it on a spectrum of how much um, uh, the, the, the gratitude that you give. It doesn't matter if it's a small plant or you've doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's a large animal like a whale. You still provide that gratitude. And a lot of that is through ceremony, through especially first species ceremony where we see uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, um, with all the foods that we eat, the returning those, uh, the flesh of those, uh, the animals, flesh of the salmon back into the water so that the spirits of those species will give themselves back to you. It's the same when you go out picking and harvesting berries. It's the same as if you're harvesting cedar for cedar weaving. I'm a cedar weaver and I've got one of my bracelets on. Um, giving, showing through prayer, through ceremony, and through gratitude, um, those gifts that the, uh, the, our environment gives to us. And it's placed in, in that spiritual, spirituality and be, comes from a sacred place. Yeah, thank you for that question. Do we have time for another question? Okay, um, I will take one more from the audience, or not. <laughs> oh, way over there. <laughs> I recognize that laugh. And the 
it's also individuality. And I'm wondering if you address that in your book. Mm. Yeah, I do. Matika, <laughs> where are you? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll just restate the question for the folks that are online. So I think that was is a beautiful question about how do we balance the realities of what our lives look like today, especially the pressures of capitalism, um, recognizing that our environment is damaged and so the foods that come from it also carry that. But how do we balance this vision and this beauty of, of food sovereignty with that? And the, the concept of food sovereignty does take that into consideration, that our lives have changed. And, the, and I do discuss this, especially in the chapter on salmon, um, because there are many people in our communities who don't have the money to buy boats. They don't have the money for nets. They don't have the time to take to go, because most families now you have both the, the you know, two people working in the family, and it's impossible for many people to find that time. So it's, well, what do we do ab about it? It is a challenge, and it's a continual challenge that we're going to face until we start seeing um, more attention placed on, on um, habitat protection, and also on a lot of it is the land back movement that we're seeing. We need those lands in order to survive. We need those lands to thrive. And you can, getting back lands that are contaminated or lands that are destroyed by overfishing or, or, or waters that are destroyed by overfishing or lands that are destroyed by mining and forestry is not something we want. It's almost like we're in a vicious loop that we're working so hard to achieve food sovereignty, that we're working so hard to to um, have the, to build those relationships that we have to our environment, yet we're seeing the destruction, and a lot of it man-made destruction, and a lot of it because of human-induced global climate change. And so it really is, I, and I, I wish I had the answer, Matika. I mean, I do present it in the book, but I present it as challenges that we need to overcome. And a lot of that is understanding, you know, the where we are today with the um, the global and industrialized food system, and what not just what it's doing to us individually, but what it's doing to our environments by the the um, manufacturing of mon monoculture food crops, moving away from polyculture farming, moving away from raising animals in um, in um, uh, open environments so that those animals can have precious lives before they give their lives to feed us. We've, we're losing that, and that's why I really saw the necessity of writing this book. So at least if people can read it and read some of the stories that I have about my attempt and my people's um, struggles to keep food sovereignty alive, that maybe it will um, propel other people to do that to find a way to do that. I haven't been out picking berries in a long time, and a lot of it is because of changes to my lifestyle, of not being able to go home during those couple of weeks when the kultka we are ripe. Um, but I understand that it's something that I need to achieve to get back to that. But we need to make these changes quickly because our worlds are changing so rapidly. And we're gonna continually see to start, we're gonna continually see these issues and to see them rise if we don't seriously look at global climate change and start trying to do something about it. I mean, we're in, we're in a crisis point right now. It isn't if we should, it's that we should. And that's where we are when it comes to these major, major global shifts because of what is happening um, to our world because of um, global warming and global climate change. Well, I think we do have to end our conversation at this point in time. Um, but I did, Charlotte, want to give you a small gift. Um, I, for the audience out there and those that are online, this is a small jar of ground blue corn. Um, this is on my Diné or Navajo side. This is one of our traditional foods. Um, and it comes from the uh, blue corn, which is more nutritious and easier to digest. 
Um, it's a type of corn that has more protein and a lower glycemic index. And we typically, uh, you can make a few things with this, but when you mix it with juniper ash and water, you can make sort of a mush that's like cream of wheat. Um, but the juniper ash actually has calcium in it, which helps to strengthen bones since so many of us are lactose intolerant. <laughs> So I just wanted to give you a gift of thanks because you've often gifted me jars of salmon. So thank you. <laughs> That's and awesome. uh, let's Let give Dr. Cote a, a thank you for sharing her book with us tonight. Let go. Thank you. And thank you, Dana. I really appreciate it. I thank the people in the t in town hall for helping coordinate this beautiful event, as well as the University of Washington Press, the publishers of my book, um, for also um, coordinating this event with town hall. Tleko ushakshitleitsu. Thank you to all of you for joining us here today. This is, as Dana, I don't know if we said this was our first in-person event. We really wanted to come in sweats. We've been zooming into everything for I don't know how long, <laughs> but we decided we needed to dress up a little bit. Thank you to everyone who's streaming in today as well. We raise our hands to all of you in thanks and appreciation. Let go. Uh, we have to give one last shout out to the upcoming food symposium. Yes. Do you want to share? Yes. So May 13th and 14th, we are holding our annual Living Breath of Wethlebalt Foods Indigenous Food Symposium at the University of Washington in the Intellectual House. Dana and I both serve as uh, committee members um, and we are planning a wonderful 10th anniversary, 10th, 10th year celebration and bringing in speakers that we've had throughout the 10 years to come back and share their thoughts about what we did in the past, what, our, um, uh, what we're doing today, and our hopes for the future when it comes to uh, foods and the sharing of foods and the revitalizing uh, of, our, of our food tradition. So we hope you can join us. It is an in-person event, but we will also be streaming for people who still aren't comfortable to to gather. We will be sharing a lot of traditional food, so uh, that might be tempting enough to bring you there. And I think, you know, crossing our fingers, we're going to be safe in May to do so. So thanks for saying We'll that. be opening up the registration link in a couple of weeks. Um, you can follow our page on Facebook, but also we have a website which I don't know the address of off yeah. the top of my head. It's <laughs> livingbreathfoodsymposium.org. You can you. find more information. <laughs> that was a kind of obvious one. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I just want to remind everybody that um, the University Bookstore is here with copies of the book for sale, and then um, we're going to have the signing just